happy to welcome back uh, David David Gardner. Uh, David and I met a, a few months back. Welcome, David. David's the uh, uh, managing partner of Co-Founders Capital, uh, and he's going to speak to us this afternoon about uh, the corporate accelerator program uh, pros and cons. So, David, good to see you again. Welcome back. Good to see you, Glenn. Thank you. Great. Well, guys, so today I've been asked to talk about um, uh, corporate accelerators are partnering with uh, corporations and getting early stage ventures to market. And I picked this picture. Don't worry, it's the only picture in my, in my deck. But I just thought it was neat how these ants had to work from both points of view, from both positions together to get this bridge uh, across. And I think there are tremendous benefits for both early stage companies and large corporations and working together and being aware of each other and, and, and leveraging what each group tends to do the best. I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm well suited to talk on this topic. I've, I've been a startup entrepreneur for over 20 years, taken seven ventures to market, had a number of successful exits. Um, I've also run innovation and a corporate accelerator um, for a large billion dollar company that acquired one of my startups. Um, and I've uh, been a venture capitalist through two funds, doing over 50 early stage investments and run a startup accelerator for the town of Cary. So I've kind of seen this from all different angles and kind of what works and what doesn't work and been an advisor to many groups uh, doing this. So let's start off with uh, why do startups, um, you know, want to uh, work with corporations? And why do corporations want to work with, uh, with startups or should they want to work with startups? So first of all, working with a big corporation, if you've got a little startup idea and you put a pot of money together against an idea, you think you're solving a big problem, getting that validation early on is really important. Getting an industry expert looking at what you're doing and telling you, hey, this has real value for us. Is it a one or is it a 10 on the list of major problems we need to solve? That'll help you with pricing, go-to-market strategy, all of those things. But then um, access to subject matter experts. Large companies have a lot of people who are good at every aspects of this. Marketing, you know, contracting, each piece of that becomes very important. And, and they can potentially bring in those experts to help you if you're part of a, or working with a, a corporation or in a corporate accelerator. And then of course, potential funding. Some startup um, accelerators and corporations uh, will put some money into that to help you uh, get going. Uh, potential go-to-market partner, they can become a marquee customer, a great reference uh, for you that can make every sale you do after that one uh, possible. But then, of course, the potential acquire. Uh, the majority of my startups were acquired by some corporation that was, first of all, a partner in some way before they turned around and decided to, uh, to acquire my company. So those are lots of goodness for startups working with uh, corporations. So let's turn it around. Why would corporations want to work with early stage innovators and startups? Well, it keeps them abreast of new technologies. They like to explore new ideas, new ways of doing things. Um, and, and, you know, innovation is hard to come by in a very large corporation. Uh, the, it everyone is so compartmentalized in what they do and so specialized that seeing that really big picture, uh, you know, they're just, they're sacred cows. It takes, you know, weeks to plan a meeting, to decide whose budget something comes out of. They just get caught down in, in servicing the machine, almost to the point that they sometimes forget what that machine was originally built to do. And this is where the fresh eyes of an innovator, someone who doesn't have any of those sacred cows or preconceived notions, can come in and think about things in a way that they just struggle doing in large corporations. So um, you, they get access to these people and these, these thinkers and, and how they're thinking about the business. Um, they get to vet potential acquisitions. Um, a lot of corporate accelerators, one of their mandates is find interesting technologies for us to acquire while they're small and less expensive. Um, another reason that corporations are involved is they um, beta test, uh, um, they become beta test customers. So they get uh, below market pricing. They often can um, shape how this new technology is going to function and, and the, the product's roadmap to what kind of they need more so than a, than a generic product might. And, um, and they can lock in most favored nation pricing. 
So there's lots of, of goodness in that respect as well. And if they end up uh, investing in these companies, uh, historically, that's been a pretty good in, a return for these corporations financially as well. So um, my advice to corporations is, and I will put, I have whole talks on this, but I'm going to put one slide in here in case there are corporate uh, people, corporate innovators involved, is uh, it's very arrogant and perilous for corporations not to regularly engage with startups. Um, and some of these uh, are well-known facts here, but innovation ultimately disrupts every industry, every industry. And one of the facts that I like to tout is that 50% of the S&P 500 companies uh, are, from 50 years ago are no longer on the, on the list. So 50% of those too big to fail failed in less than a century. So disruption comes from all of us. And either you're on that wheel, driving that wheel of innovation, or you're being run over by it. But the cycle goes on. Innovation goes on. See, CEOs dismiss uh, early stage innovators at their peril. Um, that which made you successful in the past is more than likely not what's going to make you successful in the future. And all innovation, no matter how unique you were when you founded your company and built this big company, all innovation is, has the shelf life of bread. I mean, every one of those competitive technologies, competitive differentiations are fleeting. They're in the process of disappearing and you have to come up with new ones. And, and this is why it's so important for, uh, for these large companies who have lost or stifled a lot of that risk-taking mentality to get back with the risk takers, with the people who can think out of the box and look at things with fresh eyes. Um, you often, you know, I, I, you may ask yourself, how did a company like Blockbuster Video or the big networks not see networks come, you know, Netflix coming? How did Marriott and, and, and Hilton, uh, how did they not see Airbnb coming? How did, um, you know, the, the whole taxi industry not see Uber coming? These things that, that have taken so much of their business and just totally uh, disintermediated them in many, uh, in many cases, how did you not see those coming? If you had been out there working with startups, listening, look, looking at the business plans, I, I rarely see one business plan with an idea. If I see a good idea in a business plan, I'm gonna see that five, six, seven times over the next six months, because it's almost as if ideas bloom when, when an idea's time has come, it's time has come. And lots of people get that idea and different variations of it. So if you're in tune to that, if you're looking at that deal flow, meeting with these app, if you're getting lots of applicants for your accelerator, you're gonna start seeing these ideas and going, hmm, this is interesting. This could have a dramatic impact uh, on, our, uh, on our industry. So innovation, uh, a great way for corporations to stay into that, into that innovation and driving that wheel rather than being uh, run over by it. A lot of CEOs do get that today. 42% of uh, your Fortune 1000 CEOs today say that they are very at risk uh, for disruption. And they get it. As Andy Grove said years ago, only the paranoid survive. Put yourself out of business before somebody else does. So they're interested in figuring out what do startups think? What do these guys see we don't see? How do they think different than us? So how are corporations engaging today? Those are all the reasons why they want to engage with, with uh, innovators and, and startups, and early stage ventures. So how are they going about trying to get some of that innovation inside these big corporate fiefdoms? Um, they do it in three ways, uh, typically. Uh, the first way is uh, corporate incubators. And we'll talk about those in a minute. And lots of in corporate incubators get set up and started, and, and they will sometimes give a little bit of money and take some executives to mentor the companies. But it's really just a way to get those startups in so that they can see what they're doing. Um, corporate accelerators is, a, is another way where they actually have a program, and maybe they'll bring in people from the outside, like tech stars or someone to come in and run that program for them. But then, of course, there's, there's uh, another approach that isn't used nearly enough, and that is uh, collaborating with the early stage ecosystem that's already in place. The, 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 um, the accelerators that are the local accelerators that are already in your community, the early stage venture capital funds, coordinating programs and initiatives with those people who are already connected uh, to that deal flow. 
So um, incubators and co-working spaces, uh, and, and you know, this, there are pros and cons of this. And now I'm gonna talk, I'm flipping back and forth here between talking to entrepreneurs and talking to corporations. But now let's talk to early stage entrepreneurs. Um, you know, the pros of being in a corporate accelerator or a co-working space uh, incubator program, I'm sorry, not an accelerator, the incubators are co-working space. The pro is that there's usually really flexible lease terms. If you get in there, it's usually a good deal for real estate. Um, keep in mind that um, the focus there, the con could be that the focus is on space. Here's a table, you know, here's a computer, here's some administrative services. That's not going to make or break your businesses. That's just stuff. That's the trappings of business. Um, a, another pro for these spaces is that uh, they can create environments of camaraderie. And this is a real plus, I think, where when, or when you're around other entrepreneurs, there does seem to be this vibe that it takes on where the entrepreneurs tend to help each other and bounce ideas off of each other. So it's good um, being in a place, even if they're working on different things, sharing those ideas and resources. But a con to that is um, they're not focused on individual programs. They're not vetting a very specific business idea. They're not going, hey, your business is based on this model on these assumptions. Here's a plan for us to test each of these assumptions to see how viable it is when we model your business. And so getting that level of, 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 of mentoring only happens in a really good startup accelerator with a well-defined program. And the other thing is uh, these spaces typically don't have full-time mentors, mentors. It's really focused on the space, not the services. And this is one of my, one of my favorite quotes from um, Charles Agostino uh, at LSU. He said, two things determine whether a business gets off the ground. And this is really quite, quite fundamental. Um, a, a, a valid market opportunity with customers willing to pay for a product or service, I would add <laughs> that's more than the cost of acquiring that customer, and two, a product or service that addresses such an opportunity. Only incubators he considers real are those that achieve these goals. So if you've not got a plan working towards achieving both of these things, you're not really helping that business in a strategic way. So corporate accelerators, uh, pros and cons. This is where they really have pulled executives out of the ranks and said, we want you to work on this. We want you to help these companies uh, and, and see what they're doing. They really do have a program. And so some of the pros of these corporate accelerators is uh, they, can, they, they do assign staff that usually have strong industry expertise. So they can bring the industry expertise to bear. Um, they're, they're best to have, uh, some of them have a very specific programs. They're going to use a lean startup methodology or something. Um, but then they also have access to corporate resources. So they can go out and they can, they can say, hey, you need some marketing advice. Let's go pull Susie in for marketing and she can give us some insights on that. So th these are all great parts of being uh, in a corporate accelerator. There's also some cons for the entrepreneurs. Um, internal staff, um, is not, they're not typically serially successful entrepreneurs. Um, and, and that's a problem. They may know their industry really well, but they don't know startups really well. And this is usually the case. Now they can bring in external consultants like Techstars or, or one of these groups to come in and run the startup accelerator for them. The problem with that is a consultant from, from Techstars, for example, may know a lot about startups and, and a lean methodology, but they don't know anything about that corporation. They don't know where the resources are. They don't know who's good at what, and who we can tap for this and that. So either you kind of get one or the other, but, but not necessarily connecting the two uh, together. Another con for entrepreneurs is that it can be very narrowly uh, focused. It can exclude, they can include, exclude great companies because they don't fit a, a narrow niche of what that corporation is looking for. So you've got an insurance tech accelerator. We, ha we have one here. And if it's, they, they'll tell that accelerator, we're interested in this, this, and this. Go find us companies doing this, this, and this. Well, your company might be doing this, which is a great idea, but it's just not on their top three hit list so you don't get in. Or they try to turn your company when you need to pivot towards something that's outside their focus. They don't want you to pivot because it's not one of their big initiatives. So those are the kind of things that, that can be uh, cons. There are over 7,500 corporate accelerators today from the last list that I found. This is rather dated. I'd say it's over 8,000 today. 
typical, uh, these are often revolving doors. They have a new program every six months uh, or, and they rotate a group in, rotate a group out. And you'll find that these accelerators uh, have a, a shelf life of about less than two years uh, is, the, is the lifespan before a corporate accelerator is typically uh, shut down. So a new CEO comes in, wants to be the innovative CEO, starts a corporate accelerator, and then uh, it, it tends to go away. So uh, these things, I've even seen one company recently that had four startup pro, uh, accelerator programs, and th none of the four knew about each other. So uh, it was just really big and, and not a lot of uh, cohesiveness. All right, so corporate accelerators are often not the best fit for startups. They usually provide very little capital, if any. And if they do provide capital, it's a very, very low valuation. Um, I know programs that, that take 10% you know, equity in your company and give you $18,000, $20,000 for that, which is a, a, a startup valuation of less than $200,000. The most ruthless venture capitalist I know would give you, you know, five to 10 times that amount on a startup valuation. So uh, they're not, they may not necessarily be good financial moves. Um, usually they are focused um, to guide your venture towards a solution and market that they want or they're interested in. So they're going to try to, to affect your roadmap in, in many times, which may or may not be in the right direction for the largest audience. And their success rate is typically below that of venture capital. So a startup, a corporate startup accelerator has about an 18% success rate with their companies, whereas an early stage venture fund typically has a 33 to 50% kind of success rate with depending um, on whether it's a, a big hit or a small hit. Uh, but, but certainly I think everyone would agree a far greater success rate uh, with their funded companies there than the corporate accelerators. And then they may also have poison pills which I've negotiated around my whole life. Um, they want to write a first refusal to buy your business. They don't want you to sell to certain competitors. Uh, many of these things can be poison pills that will keep you from getting real venture capital funding uh, in the future or acquire customers. So my advice for startups and, and, and entrepreneurs is kind of a hybrid approach. The third thing when I list the three approaches to innovation for corporations. Um, corporations, I believe, the best approach for them is to partner with early stage venture funds and accelerators that already exist in a given community. They can engage startups through these existing programs and because there's gonna be a lot more deal flow. These guys know what they're doing. They do it all day long, every day. Um, and, and I think that through these innovative relationships, they can have a lot better success and access to a lot more opportunities. So this, um, what I call the, uh, the VC catalyst uh, or the existing ecosystem catalyst model has advantages for startups and corporations. Uh, for the corporations, you gain an ongoing value added VC partner. They know how to help start companies. They know how to get them funded in the future. Um, they know how to build go to market strategies. Um, and then you bring your subject matter expertise and, and your, and your uh, you know, the credibility to the table. So you're taking the best of both worlds, access to a greater number of deal flows. Typical venture capitalists like myself, we get 12, 15 deals a day in to vet. Whereas a corporate accelerator might take on a class of, you know, a dozen companies twice a year. Um, it's less expensive. You know, it's expensive to run a corporate accelerator. These executives are paid big salaries. Um, and then of course, improved outcomes as I've already discussed. But then the pros for entrepreneurs, uh, better valuations, better deal terms, uh, more paths to success. Uh, most startups don't get it right the first time. They have to pivot, go a slightly different direction. And, and a venture capitalist, seasoned venture capitalist will help you navigate what those pivots maybe should be. Then access to more capital. Most VCs, if they invest a million dollars, they're going to set aside a couple more million to protect that venture. Whereas your corporate accelerator program, as we've said, statistically will be gone in less than two years. Um, and then better goal alignment. We don't care if your venture turns out to be something totally different than what you thought it was when you came into the door. As long as it makes money and is successful is all we're looking for. So um, I want to talk for just a second about business development versus uh, sales. And you'll understand where I'm going with this in just a minute, because what early stage ventures need is not necessarily sales, they need business development. Sales, 
This requires an articulate person to explain the benefits of a well-defined discrete offering. It utilizes provided sales collateral. The salesperson is going to ask probing questions and handle typical objections that they've been trained to manage to close a transaction, a well-defined specific transaction. And they're going to drive home the strengths of the seller's company and the product to close that sale. Business development is very different. It requires a, a seasoned business executive. They have to write a custom business plan together with their business partner. So when you start this discussion, you don't necessarily know what you're selling. You know that you have certain strengths and that your partner has certain strengths. How can you find synergy between the two? So you seek a deep understanding of the partner's strategic goals, and you develop a process that will enable both companies to thrive and utilize their strengths. In business development, you seek to understand the partner's strengths and ways to leverage those for both companies, the mutual benefit. So this is the way of thinking um, when it comes to how you want to go to market partner. And, you know, I was, I, I, I've got lots of examples here and I wanted to see how my time was going as to see how many of these I can talk about. <laughs> but uh, hey, I think we're, up, we're, we're, we're tied on time, David, I think. All right. Well, I'll go ahead and, and wrap it up then. Uh, but there's lots and lots of examples that I can share with you of how we went to corporations and said, we've got this. What can you bring to the table? Maybe access made to your customer base or maybe some bundling opportunities. But those kind of one-off discussions really lead to great collaboration for both the corporations and the startup entrepreneurs. Uh, anyway, that's all I have time for today. Thank you so much for, uh, for having me. David, thank you as always. Very, very, very informative. Uh, always great to, to catch up and get, get your insights on, on all, 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 all the different playing playing fields. Just for our audience, David's, uh, David's contact information, as well as all of our speakers' information, is in the speaker tab on the uh, conference site. So feel free, feel free to reach out as we go. David, good to see you again. Thanks for participating today. Uh, terrific Thanks, presentation. Bye, everyone.